Okay, John chapter 3. Okay, what do you do if somebody wants to argue about eternal security? A long time ago, I had this, this guy in jail that argued with me about eternal security. So every Saturday, I'd come around to his side, he'd argue with me for about an hour, and I'd answer his questions. So three Saturdays in a row, that happened, and the fourth one, I thought, I'm getting tired of this. So I just kind of, I don't know if I sidestepped the argument or avoided the guy. And then the fifth Saturday came around, and of course, he wanted to bring it up again. He said, I have one more question on eternal security. I said, okay, what is it? I've answered all your questions so far. He says, it's in 1 John, but I can't find a verse. I said, it's chapter 3, verse 8. And he looked at it and he said, yep, that's right. Uh, what's the answer? And I gave him the answer. And uh, he, he's, you know, I waited a week or two and I said, did you ever get that thing settled? He said, yep, I did. So then I started giving him some commentaries, Ruckman commentaries, and he's reading like one a week. I mean, of course, they had a lot of time. And this is Jasper County Jail. At that time, they didn't have a TV or anything like that in the jail. And uh, he was in there for 11 months. At that, at that stage, uh, a prisoner could only stay in a county jail 12 months. Now it's 24 in Indiana. But it was 12, and so he was shipped out 11 months. And before he left, I said to him, I said, do you remember when you argued with me about eternal security? He said, yep. I said, what were you doing? He said, well, I'd argue with you on Saturdays against eternal security and the fellows on Wednesday for eternal security. These guys came in on Wednesdays that were Arminians. And he said, and I saw all sorts of holes in arguments and I couldn't find any in yours. I said, oh, okay. That's a blessing. And they, so, they say, those same two fellows, I have said to people that believe in eternal security, actually what they believe, they believe that you can lose your salvation, but they cannot lose theirs. So these two fellows sat another guy down or sat you know, across the bars for two hours and talked to him why eternal security was wrong. And then the fellow said, tell me. Can you personally lose yours? And the guy says, no. He said, so you just lied to me for two hours. And that's what they really believe. Okay, John chapter 3. Let's pray first. Lord, I do pray you'd help us to understand these words. And I pray that you'd help us to rejoice in the eternal salvation that you have given. But Lord, even at that, I pray that we would uh, not... Use that for fleshly gain, for fleshly desires. I pray you'd help us to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, John chapter 3, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night, said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So the promise, if you're born again, you see the kingdom of God. Now this is one of the rare occurrences in the Bible that the kingdom of God is, is, is referred to physically. Uh, and that will be mainly the millennium is what it points at. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Okay, so he thought it was on the fleshly nature. That's the question. Verse 5, Jesus answers the question. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water, first birth, and of the Spirit, second birth, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Verse 6 parallels 5. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's the water birth. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. That's the second birth. Now, water dogs will make verse 5 baptism. Okay, they always, they always got to throw baptism in there. Verse 7, Jesus said, Marvel not that I said unto thee, 
ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth. The wind, that's a picture of the Holy Ghost, bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it, it cometh, and whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. And so salvation by grace through faith, uh, it's faith in Jesus Christ, and the only one that knows beyond a reasonable shadow of doubt that I'm saved is God, the devil, and me. And even at that, some people I don't even know if they're saved. <laughs> but God and the devil knows. Okay, then he says, that, or Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? See, none of this was taught in the Old Testament because nobody was born, in the old, born again in the Old Testament. Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel and knoweth not these things? He was appalled by his ignorance. And what the Lord is referring to uh, is Psalms 22. And I have in Psalms 22, verse 30, this is the beginning of the new birth. Psalms 22 is known, commonly known as the crucifixion psalm. Psalm 22, verse 1, you can see clearly the quote that Jesus made on the, on the cross. And then we read down through that, you can see this is clearly a picture of Jesus on the cross. And as a result of his price for salvation on the cross, verse 30 begins the new birth. A seed shall serve him. It, the seed, shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. This is a seed of the Lord. Somebody's born again of God. Verse 31, they shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, born again, that he hath done this. So in the New Testament for salvation, we declare unto the sinner the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And for you to get eternal life, you accept the righteousness of Jesus Christ as your payment of sins and you get born again. And see, that's, that's how that's written. The very first person born of God. Now, this one you can throw on fundamental Baptists because they think everybody's saved the same way Old Testament, New Testament. Ask them, who's the first person born of God? Uh, they might say Adam, but that's not true. He was created. And the first one born of God, who is the firstborn of the Beloved, Colossians 1.15, is Jesus Christ. And so that shows us that nobody in the Old Testament was born again. Nobody in the Old Testament had eternal security. Okay, and the eternal security is the great benefit of the new birth. Okay, so if you have somebody and they want to argue about that issue, again, as we've done you want to always make sure you establish this. And, you, and you, if you say, okay, that's going to be our discussion, uh, you establish the authority. Make sure you get the rules. And uh, if this person has any interested interest in that subject, no doubt they're going to say, okay, the Bible is the final authority for all matters of faith and practice. So you have the, uh, the uh, uh, rules laid out. And pretty much these people that want to argue this subject, they would agree. If you start off at a place of agreement, you always want to try to find a place that you can agree with them and then slowly get them to the place where they, in essence, will have to agree with you. Okay, and the place of agreement is that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. John fourteen six. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Acts 4.12, and there is none other name given among men whereby you must be saved. So salvation is found in Jesus Christ. Okay, and then you establish, you know, you, you have to assume that they're sincere in their beliefs. Now, you're going to find out that they're usually not. But go on the assumption at first that they are sincere. And if they're going to ask these questions. So accept the person's word for it and assume their sincerity. And then, personally, I would just go through the gospel presentation at that point. 
If they don't know for sure they're saved, in essence, they don't have eternal security, I'd just say, well, how, how would you like to know how to get eternal security? Because a lot of times they're not saved. Okay, so I would try that, but then if they still don't want to go that route, then I would just start, again, you start with the very simple, clear verses that deal with eternal salvation. Okay, and so, uh, somebody give me a couple clear verses on eternal salvation. 1 John 5.13 These things have I written unto you that to believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal, eternal, eternal life. It didn't say life unless you can keep it. Okay, how about the famous John 3.16? It says everlasting life. It didn't say Everlasting life based on condition. It didn't say everlasting life on a probationary period. Last time I checked, everlasting is a long time. Everlasting is something that begins and has no ending. Eternal is something that has no beginning and no ending. And look at the benefit we get of the new birth. We get both. John three fifteen and 16. John 3.15, Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, is there a difference between those two? I, I believe so. We have everlasting life because as a human being, we had a beginning. But we get eternal life because as we're placed in Christ, we have no beginning, no end. So the Lord gives us both on that. Okay, uh, John 5, verse 24. And of course, when you're dealing with something like this, they're going to see those verses. They're going to be very clear. The King James Bible is very clear. And you're going to see them. Oh, hot potato. Got to get rid of that. Let's go over to these complex verses. No, no, let's stay with the simple right now. Just look at them and say, well, I'm not real smart. And I've got to understand the simple things. And, you know, they always want to be so intellectual. People always want to think they're so intelligent. Uh, let's take the clear. John 5, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but is passed from death unto life. Boy, that's pretty clear. How about John 6:47? Well, let's try John 6:37 also. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Well, I like those. 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. The two words on me are removed in the New Bibles. John 10.28 these are very clear, simple verses. John 10, 28. And I give unto them eternal life, and they might perish if they sin willfully according to the flesh. <laughs> Now that is uh, taking Hebrews 10.26 and throwing it in with John 10.28. I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Have, any of, have anybody heard them say, well, I can pluck myself out of God's hand. Have you heard that? Yeah, I've had them say that. I just smile and say, you, you're stronger than God? Yeah. Now obviously, doctrinally, that verse, you can see doctrinally that it implies nation of Israel 
And technically speaking, it's not that you and I are in God's hand. According to 1 Corinthians, you and I are God's hand. We're in His body. And the Lord went to hell and deposited our sins, and He's not going back. So John 10.28 is probably the clearest one you could throw at Him. <clears throat> and then Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1. Uh, verse 12, it says that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom he also trusted. After that, he heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Okay, so the Holy Spirit of God there is known as earnest money or down payment money. And that's going to be completed on the day of closing, which will be the rapture, where we get a new body. That's called the redemption of our body. Romans chapter 8, verse 23. Redemption of our body. You see, at the moment you got saved, our soul is redeemed in Jesus Christ. But our body is still falling apart. You know, mine's fighting a cold. So our body's falling apart, but my soul is redeemed. Well, at the rapture, we get a body like Jesus Christ. Therefore, I get a body that's redeemed. That's the day we're waiting for. Now, the inherit or the earnest money, the down payment money, is the Holy Ghost that's placed in your body. That's God's promise to complete the purchase on the day of closing. And how long does He seal us? Ephesians four verse thirty. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. And that would be the redemption of our body at that cross-reference, Romans 8.23. Now, it's strange, you know, to grieve the Spirit of God. If you sin and lose the Spirit of God, then he wouldn't be sticking around. Okay, and then you can give illustrations. And here's the illustrations I usually give to somebody. I usually say, well, are you still your mom and dad's child? Because the Lord takes a physical thing, birth, the natural birth. Okay, and the natural birth, when John Wayne Gacy committed the horrible crimes that he did, did that, did that fourth hit? Him from being his mother's child? No, you ain't going to change anything in that. You see, once you're born into a family, there's nothing you can do to change that. Now, I know kids, some, you know, a few are trying to divorce their parents, but you can't change the bloodline. Now, you can be a good child or a bad child. Now, if you want to stay in good fellowship with your parents, you obey them. And the same goes with God. If you want to stay in good fellowship with God, you obey Him, but you never cease being God's child. Okay, and, that, and then they'll say, well, you can give up your salvation. You can reject God. And then they got all these verses they want to throw at you. Another example is, it's like a contract. You can ask them this question. Okay, if you've made a contract with somebody, and you have discovered uh, that... You underpriced yourself in your contract. And the other party is really going to get advantage of you. Does that mean you don't obey your contract? No, you're supposed to keep your word, aren't you? Okay, so when God, uh, when somebody gets saved and God's not getting value out of that person, does God nullify his contract? No, it's an everlasting covenant. And that's far, as far as the nation of Israel. So we all understand that if you give somebody your word on something and you find out that it's for your damage, you still got to fulfill your contract. And God does that. 
Thank God he keeps his word. Another example is sports. Uh, Sports will help explain the judgment seat of Christ. But what I've done with people like this, uh, I've asked them this question. I look at them and say, how many sins are going to take you to lose it? I had a guy showed up at Rensselaer one time. We got talking about this, and he believed in eternal insecurity. So I said to him, I said, how many sins are going to take you to lose it? He said, one. And I said, can I name a few? Sure. So I named some that I knew he would agree with. Drinking, smoking, cussing. Yeah, he didn't mind that. He said, oh, yeah. I said, how about overeating? Well, he started backpedaling on that one. Overeating, undereating, oversleeping, undersleeping. <laughs> well, 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 I said, hey, sin, sin. And boy, he didn't want to talk anymore about this subject. Okay, now, if somebody says it's going to take one sin for them to lose it, what do they think they are at that time? They think they're sinless. What's John 1 verse 8 say about somebody who believes they're sinless? 1 John 1 8. 1 John 1 verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Several years ago, there's, there's this guy that was... Uh, had a little following of fellas, and he basically said that he's sinless. And so I thought it'd be kind of fun to have him speak. I'd say, if somebody's sinless, I want to learn how to do that. And I knew it was going to be a hoot anyway. So I, had, I invited him to come over to Rensselaer after church on a Sunday night, and he was going to show us how to be sinless like him. And so we started asking him Bible questions, and he didn't even know where Isaiah was. And, uh, of course, it was only men that came. Is he and about five men. None of them brought their wives. I wanted to ask their wives about this sinless character that they're living with. And finally, Charles asked them the whopper of a question. Charles raised his hand with his one finger up. He said, oh, would you read Ecclesiastes 7, 20, he says. <laughs> and when he said that, I said, oh, 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 oh hot potato, here we go. And he turned to Ecclesiastes 720, had a look at his table of contents, this guy did, great Bible scholar. And that verse says, There is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. When that guy hit that, it, it jarred him for 15 seconds. And 15 to 20 seconds of silence, you know, in front of a crowd, that's a long time. And he quickly goes, I know what this is. This is First Peter chapter 4, verse 17. And I started laughing. And I said, hot potato, hot potato. And he said, judgment begins at the house of God. That's what this is all about. And so I, we asked him if he could lose his salvation. He said, no. And then it was my turn. To, I was going to give him so much time. Then it was my turn to speak. And we got on eternal security. And the guy said, that's enough. He took a little broom. He had a broom stuck in his shoe. He took a little wisp broom and went like this. Dusted them off, you know, like it says in the Bible, dust your feet off. And they couldn't, stay, they couldn't take listen to me for five minutes. And we sat and listened to that guy for 45 minutes. And so then they actually cussed the church. They said, blank on this church. And started singing a song against the church. And I'm trying to think, okay, we've got to get rid of these guys somehow. I don't want a big mess going on here. So I went in the gym and got a push broom. And they were in a hall, and I just started going like this. See you later, fellas. <laughs> and finally got rid of them that way. But uh, the arguments that these people throw at, they believe they're sinless. There's a guy in Bailey Corner. He's dead now. Jesse Bailey. Bailey Baptist Church. Hadn't sinned for 40-some years. Of course, you go to his house. I, I knocked on his door in his house. I was hoping to get an opportunity to talk to this sinless man. Trash everywhere. House falling apart. So I was going to show him the verse where the building droppeth through must, with much slothfulness and ask him if laziness was sin. <laughs> but I didn't get the opportunity. 
Okay, so, uh, and then, an amazing thing is, these people that believe you can lose your salvation, they all believe you can get it back. Okay, so if you can get it back, what does the Bible say about somebody that when a sinner repents, what is, happens in heaven? When a sinner repents, what do they do in heaven? They rejoice. Okay, so we can make heaven so happy, get saved on mo Sunday, lose it on Monday, get saved on Tuesday, they're twice as happy. Lose it on Wednesday, get saved on Thursday, they're three times as happy. Lose it on Friday, get saved again on Saturday. And that's the insanity of it when you deal with these people. So, uh, here's what they're going to throw at you. Then they're going to say, well, then you believe you can just live the way you want and, and get away with sin. Well, what's the answer for that? Romans chapter 6, verse 1. You see, these people have failed to study Romans 4 and 5 on imputed righteousness and justification. Since they have failed to study Romans 4 and 5, Romans 1, 2, and 3 deals with the sinfulness of man. Romans 4 and 5 deals with the justification by grace through faith. And it's a free gift. And since they have failed to study that, chronologically, the Lord will throw, up the, throw at them the first argument that they're going to throw at you. Is well, you think you can just sin and get away with it. Romans 6, verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? The answer is God forbid. Then they're going to say, well, what about? And so then you want to start going down their verses. What about? Matthew 24, 13. So let's try it. Matthew 24, 13. What about Matthew 24? We don't have time to go through all the verses. We'll just pick on a few of them. That You're going to find that the verses that they're going to run you to show you that you lose your salvation will be Ezekiel 18 or Old Testament passages, Matthew 24 and 25, Hebrews, James. Those are their main focuses. Matthew 24, verse 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Okay, so somebody's enduring to the end. So when somebody reads that, you know, you don't get all panicky. You say, boy, that is a verse. Isn't that a whopper? Looks like somebody does have to endure to the end. Well, you can look at that. Or you could, you know, hold your finger there. I'll show you one you've already endured to the end. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 8. Paul wrote this in verse 7. So that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Already confirmed there. <laughs> Okay, but back in Matthew 24, that, that one is so far over them, I wouldn't even mess with it. Uh, but Matthew 24, 13, somebody's got to endure to the end. Look what gospel's being preached in the next verse. It's not the gospel of the grace of God, is it? Look who he's talking to in verse um, 15. Or he's warning about an abomination of desolation. Do you see the time period this is focused at? If you're not certain yet, drop down to verse 21 and you'll see it clearly. Great tribulation. Verse 21. This is somebody doctrinally aimed at the great tribulation. And it happens to be Jews, what he's aiming that at. Why would a flesh and blood Gentile in the church age try to take some doctrine for somebody in the tribulation who's a Jew who is operating under a Mosaic covenant to pull it in now? There's no logic to that at all. Okay, let's try another one. Hebrews 3. And let's skip that one. Let's go to Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6 is probably their most popular. And Hebrews 10. But Hebrews 6 is the... Probably their heart, the heart one that they try to use. Again, notice the title of the book. Hebrews. 
But all you have to do is if, if you read this verse with them, these three verses, Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, it will speak against their arguments. Hebrews 6, 4, it says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they fall away to renew them again under repentance. Saying they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Notice that says that if... Verse 6, if you fall away, verse 4, it's impossible for you to get renewed to repentance. That verse says, if you lose it, you can't get it back. All of them teach that you can lose it and get it back, and they base it on this verse. And they're not even reading the verse. Now, if a person says, well, what's the doctrine of that one? Again, it's a tribulation thing. And what is a condition of sin? The sin level is different than it is today. Sin is a transgression of the law. The sin there is probably the great transgression taking the mark of the beast. And they take the mark of the beast, they lost their salvation, and they're going to hell. Hebrews 10, verse 26, another one. I just dealt with this one with uh, some woman in correspondence. Hebrews 10, 26. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice of sins. Well, this woman's definition of willful was quite interesting. A willful sin was for you to take your fist and wave it up in heaven and say, I reject what you say, and I'm going to do what I want. <laughs> so this woman that thought that she obeyed all the Bible, I wrote her and asked her to give me $100 based on Matthew 5.42, where it says, Give unto them that ask of thee. And then I asked her if she has taken her fist up, reached up into heaven and said, I reject to give that man $100 in obeying the scriptures. And she actually said that she has not sinned willfully since the day she got saved. Well, with that kind of definition, who's done that? Very, very few people have done that. Sinning willfully is what every, oh, virtually every time we sin, we do it of our own willful nature. Who hasn't sinned willfully since the day they got saved? All of us have. And so again, this, this passage is dealing with Hebrews. And it's talking about sacrifice. And this is a sacrifice in a temple. And it's again dealing with the tribulation. Okay, Ezekiel chapter 18 is a famous one, but this one's pretty easy to answer because it's Old Testament doctrine, living under Mosaic covenant. Ezekiel 18, verse 20. Ezekiel 18. Now, historically, uh, Presbyterians, Baptists, and the Reformed, the Dutch Reformed, historically have held to eternal security. Uh, Methodists, Lutherans, Catholics, Pentecostals, um, I'm not sure about Congregationalists, uh, generally have held against eternal security. John Wesley, is, you know, Charles Wesley, they were Methodists. They believed that a person could lose their salvation. Uh, does that mean these people are not saved? No, I'm not, that's not even the issue. Uh, Lots, there's, it's a rare thing that if a Pentecostal does give the gospel presentation to somebody, it's a rare thing that they will come out and eventually say, well, you know that you have to trust Christ your Savior and then you have to do all this in order to keep it. Now, a lot of them just try to get folks to trust Christ. They don't bring in the idea that they could lose their salvation until they see them uh, possibly leaving the church and then they can kind of hold them into the system by bringing up the idea that they can lose their salvation. And, of course, they all have a different standard level of what it's going to take for you to lose it. If you're not holy like me or like their church. 
And that's why a lot of times the Pentecostal church will have factions and have splits and shoot-offs because somebody's more holy than somebody else. And they get arguing about it. Okay, so Ezekiel 18, verse 20. It's amazing. That's probably the thing these guys in jail to argue with me about more than anything. I would think the ones behind the bars would be arguing for eternal security. You know? But that's what they... And it's usually Pentecostal fellas, and they usually come up and say, well, my granddad was a preacher. <laughs> so? <laughs> Does that mean you can go live like the devil? Well, my granddad was a preacher. <laughs> Ezekiel 18.20, it says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. 24, but when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live. All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned in his trespass that he hath trespassed and in his sin that he hath sinned in them shall he die. Jesus said in John eight twenty one and 24 that when a man dies in his sins, he goes to hell. Now, Jesus didn't say it that way. He just basically said, if you die in your sin, you don't go where I'm going. Verse 27. Again, when a wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed, and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. Okay, in the Old Testament, remember that they had a part of their personal righteousness. You and I do not. The righteousness that you and I have in the New Testament is the righteousness of Jesus Christ and Him alone. That is our salvation. Now, does that mean in the New Testament that a person, a saved believer, technically... Now, let's be technical about it. If somebody trusts Christ as their only hope for heaven, at that moment they have placed their faith and trust in Christ, at that moment, and then go out and something happens to them where they live the way they want to live to the day they die, and they actually murder somebody and all this stuff, will that person go to heaven? Of course. Now, do we encourage that? Of course not. <laughs> But it's like this. I, you know, these people, usually when you talk to these people, they know nothing of the judgment seat of Christ. And the judgment seat of Christ, the promise is, if you're born again, the promise is, you will see the kingdom of God when Jesus Christ is on earth. You will enter it. You will be able to walk in it. That is the limitation. You will see it. You will enter it. If you only get those two, that beats the alternative. Okay, which is hell. Now, if you want to be a participant of it, if you want to rule with Jesus Christ, if you want to be an active member in it, that's when we suffer and serve Jesus Christ. Like in sports, anybody can get on a t-ball team. Anybody can. You just go sign up. You know, they. I don't think they reject anybody on t-ball. Obviously, they don't, if you watch. <laughs> when Brent started playing, he ran third base. He thought that was better. <laughs> he didn't know anything about baseball. <laughs> Six years old. Now they're starting four, aren't they? Some T-ball is four years old. Okay, so anybody can get on a T-ball team. Now, as they grow up and they stay on a team... Who gets the rewards? Who gets the trophies? Who gets the awards? The ones who have practiced constantly, the ones who have basically given their life. Who becomes professionals and get multi-million dollar contracts? The ones who stayed with it, not the ones who quit. Now, does that say the ones that quit were not baseball players at one time? No, they're baseball players. It's just that they don't get the awards. The same goes with the judgment seat of Christ. What guarantees your trip to the judgment seat of Christ is your salvation. 
that guarantees you're going to be judged there. You change venue from the white throne judgment to the judgment seat of Christ. Now at the judgment seat of Christ, if we suffer and serve Jesus Christ, then there are awards given out. Gold, silver, precious stones. Possibility of five or seven crowns. You can possibility of getting all of them. And what comes with a crown is a kingdom of some type. And so you get the rule of Jesus Christ. So does that mean in the millennium you can tell how a Christian lived? Yeah. Yep. And so that's basically how the judgment seat of Christ is laid out, what the Lord has. And that's how we do it in life too. And so you have, we have everyday illustrations that proves that demonstrates, that illustrates eternal security in Jesus Christ. You could also go with the marriage thing. As far as the Bible teaches on the marriage, where the second marriage is more binding than the first, and that's where eternal security comes in play. Deuteronomy chapter 24, when a man and woman's married, if he divorces her and gets a second wife, he cannot go back to the first wife. So... At, before you got saved, you had your body and soul were married together. Your spirit's like dead spirit. And then when you get saved, your soul and spirit, your flesh is cut from your soul. In other words, it's a divorce from your soul. And your soul is married to your spirit, married to Jesus Christ. And your second marriage is more binding than the first. That's eternal security. Okay, so that uh, should help. If you have any other verses on that, just... Let me know on those. Okay, we'll stop there. Let's pray. Lord, I do pray. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for eternal security in Jesus Christ. I do pray that you'd help us to uh, use the gifts that you've given us to serve you faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen.